Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this exciting edition of the Aquaculture Webinar Series. This series is brought to you by the National Aquaculture Association, the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center, and the United States Aquaculture Society. It's designed to enhance aquaculture production and educational opportunities throughout the United States. Today's webinar is entitled Strengthening Aquaculture Associations and will be presented by Dr. Carol Engel, co-owner of Inglestone Aquatics. Carol is an aquaculture economist with more than 35 years of experience working with aquaculture associations on marketing and economic issues related to a variety of aquaculture businesses across the United States. Current efforts include working with the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center and the National Aquaculture Association to identify and implement strategies to strengthen state aquaculture associations in the North Central Region. Thank you for being with us today, Carol. Take it away. Thank you, Alan. I'd like to first welcome everybody to this webinar here today. Secondly, before we get started, I would ask that anyone who has questions or questions that occur to them throughout the webinar, if you would please type those into the Q&A box on, on your screen, I will attempt to answer your questions at, at the end of, of this webinar. Well, to begin, as many of you know, there are many different types of associations of, of aquaculture around the United States. Some of these are national, some of these are specific to certain species, some of these are for, are for individual states and include statewide producers, some are industry trade associations, and there are others that are more oriented towards academic professionals and research individuals. For a variety of reasons, I'm going to focus more on industry associations, and but the different aspects of these associations that we're going to talk about do also apply to many other types of associations. The first question really is, so why are aquaculture associations important? There are lots of ways to answer this, and we'll talk about different reasons for membership and associations and the kind of value that can be obtained from effective and active aquaculture associations. But one of the reasons that is clear and seemingly ever present in terms of why it's important to belong to an association is this veritable curtain of regulations that many aquaculture producers face across the United States. In a previous webinar, we discussed some of the findings of work that Jonathan Van Setten and I have been doing to, to look at the effects on farms of, of this web of network of regulations that many producers face. One of the ways to, to think about membership though in an association and one of the reasons why association membership, membership is so important is that these associations do watch out for aquaculture businesses Engaging in these associations is one way to begin to deal with some of these regulatory issues. Whenever we talk with producers or, or whenever producers get together, inevitably these regulatory issues of the day come to the forefront. What's on the screen here are just several recent examples of the kinds of issues that are important to producers across the United States. The question becomes what can be done? It's possible for individual producers to send in comments on proposed rules. Many times the listings in the Federal Register notice have questions requesting information from producers so that regulators can make decisions that are fully informed about, about how to comply with, with different laws. So individual farms can and should send in comments on these different rules. However, for many of these different kinds of laws, the burden of discussing and proving the impacts of these proposed rules is on the producer and not on the government. So in order to be active and address these kinds of things, means that individual producers would need to spend a, a great deal of time monitoring the Federal Register in order to know what rules are being discussed and to know what the deadlines are. An alternative is to be an active member of, a, of an association or multiple associations. Most associations do send out alerts on these types of things, have people that do monitor the Federal Register notices. And so one viable alternative to this is to be an active member of, of one or multiple associations. 
So why should you join an association? Well, the reality is that numbers do matter. The representation on the part of aquaculture producers and, and other support individuals in research and extension positions is absolutely critical. Lawmakers are trying to represent their constituents, but if the only constituents they hear from are NGOs who have certain specific interests about the way things should go and they do not hear from the farming community, they don't have full information to make good decisions. So numbers do matter in these associations when dealing with these kinds of kinds of issues. Why pay dues? It's a cost, clearly. Why pay dues to an association? What's the value of membership? I would argue that one of the reasons to pay those dues that typically are, are not substantial costs, one of those reasons is to protect your business. It's also to invest in the future of your business. The activities of many successful associations are really vital to that industry and, and to the individual businesses that, that are part of those industries. The other type of investment that really is quite important for successful associations and for associations to be effective and successful is that their members spend time on association activities. So it's a different kind of investment and it takes time away from your business. Why should you do this? Well, again, if we talk strictly in terms of regulations, it's easier for your elected officials to take actions on behalf of an association rather than on a single individual. So there are many reasons to, to belong. I would also argue that it's a lot of fun to belong to a lot of the associations that, that focus on aquaculture. It's a great time to get together with people who are facing similar problems to what you face, to get together and share examples and share strategies and things like that and just have a good time but have a good time with people that, that are doing the same kinds of things and, and come together to do that. Now, as I said at the outset, there actually are quite a lot of different types of associations. We have national associations like the National Aquaculture Association that is addressing national issues. And in fact, maybe many national policy issues are best addressed by national associations. The NAA has a long list of issues that they're working on, but some of their recent priorities involve the Lacey Act. This recent petition to list many fish species as injurious, that does include tilapia and many other species, for example. If in fact tilapia would be listed as injurious, it becomes illegal to transport tilapia across interstate lines, live tilapia across interstate lines, for example a depredation order for cormorants and those kinds of problems and many others that NAA is working on on a national level. And a national association is best to address national policies. We also have across the United States a wide variety of species specific associations. I'm going to use examples in this webinar of associations that I've worked most closely with these first examples are, are from the Catfish Farmers of America and some of the activities that they have ongoing on behalf of, of their members and, and their association. But as many of you know, we have many associations that, that, that are associations of species like the U.S. Trout Farmers Association, the Striped Bass Growers Association, the Tilapia Alliance, there's a Pacific Coast Shellfish Growers Association, the East Coast Shellfish Growers Association. So these are important associations for individual species groups that do work on, on issues that are specific to their species. I would argue that it's important for everyone to be members of a variety of associations, belong to the national associations like NAA, belong to and join the species association for the species that you're raising. And then later on, we'll talk more specifically about state aquaculture associations as well. So it's important to do, to belong to many of these because they address different issues. The Catfish Farmers of America, for example, has been very active in terms of the, the farm bill. One of the issues that many of you have probably heard of is 
the catfish inspection rule that moved inspection of U.S. farm-raised catfish away from FDA and into USDA, into the Food Safety Inspection Service, where other meat and poultry products are also inspected. So they've been moved into an inspection program that, that handles other major protein, farm protein sources in the United States. One of the reasons for this is that within FSIS, the fundamental principle that they operate on is equivalency, which means that any imports into the United States of, of this group of fish would be held to equivalent food safety standards as those that we have in the United States. Important market implications for that. They've also worked on catfish insurance, anti-dumping tariffs, that were en enacted because of the unfair business practices that resulted in dumping or selling below fair market price in the United States that, that is not legal in the United States and, and not considered legal around the world. In addition to those kinds of activities, Catfish Farmers of America through the Catfish Institute has also been engaged in very, engaged in very effective marketing programs they work to develop a brand for U.S. farm-raised catfish. They develop co-marketing programs that have been effective. They also have a very exciting program to develop their young farmers into future leaders in, in the catfish industry. I'll come back to this point later on. But for those associations that have not explicitly work to engage young farmers. I, I really suggest that they take a look at the Catfish Farmers of America program because obviously leadership succession is important to, to, to long-term viability of any association. Their Young Farmers program brings together young catfish farmers from across different states. They get to know each other, they build bonds, it establishes a framework for networking that becomes very, very important down the road as these younger farmers move into leadership positions in, in their industry. Catfish Farmers of America has also worked to, to develop country of origin labeling programs at the individual state level that's been very, very important. CFA also sponsors and holds and hosts a research forum every three years. This is their program, and as their program, a panel of catfish farmers select the papers to be presented. This is an important way that an association can send strong messages to the research community about the kinds of research that they value and that is important to their industry. They make awards to those researchers that have contributed to the most, you know, the most to addressing their problems on, on their farms. Again, an important way to send messages to, to the research community of the kinds of things that, that they need research activities and funding to be spent on. They also make service awards to extension personnel, research personnel, again, recognizing and rewarding those that are working on things that are important to their industry. So it's important to, to belong to a species-specific association that addresses these issues that are important to their specific species. Now within all of this, as I think many of you already know, the majority of the regulations though that you all face are state regulations. It's much more difficult for a national association or even a species specific association to address these kinds of issues. And so we need to start talking about, about strong state associations who are better positioned to be able to address these kinds of issues. U.S. aquaculture has, has been around for many, many decades. And along the way, for much of its history, a lot of the issues that, uh, issues that ended up being becoming part of this whole regulatory web sort of floated on the surface and it was possible for sectors of U.S. aquaculture, especially in their infancy or smaller sectors, to kind of, to kind of stay below this, this, this web of regulatory issues. But as aquaculture in the United States grew and became ever more successful, and it became recognized as an industry, many of these potential minefields started to affect a lot of different sectors of U.S. aquaculture. We're in a day and age right now that 
that it's really not very possible or viable to, to avoid these kinds of things, mostly due to the success of the industry, that's growth and development that led to more attention and with this, with this come a lot of different issues. One of the best ways to address these issues as a producer is to engage with other producers in associations to work on a variety of levels to address the issues that, that these different industries are facing. I'm going to share a few success stories that I'm familiar with. I'm going to base these mostly on, on my own experience working with some associations. Many of you know that I spent many years working in Arkansas, and so these two examples of, of, of very successful and effective state associations I'm going to draw from, from my years in Arkansas. There are two main associations in the state, the Arkansas Bait and Ornamental Fish Growers Association, and also the Catfish Farmers of Arkansas. I'm going to start with the Arkansas Bait and Ornamental Fish Growers Association. I think this is just really a, a fascinating story of, of some far-sighted industry leaders recognizing the need to form an association and recognizing that in order to gain members and to retain members, the association needs to provide clear value to those members especially in the beginning. If there is a way to find a tangible value, it's much easier to recruit members to the association. The bait fish industry is, is, is a bit different from a lot of other industries in that it's not a food fish. So when this association was formed, it was formed because there were some pests that they were having problems with. There was research that identified some compounds that were successful in treating those pests but those compounds were labeled only for use in food fish ponds because the label did not explicitly include the species that they raised that are not food fish. They were not able to have access to these compounds. So they pulled together. They came together as an association, obtained a label as a special local needs label and approval to use these particular compounds and manage that label as an association because these compounds were so important to, to the producers in their industry, being able to, to have access to these chemicals was a real value to these particular producers, and they joined the association. From that early start and that early membership, they have really grown and developed into what I consider some very exciting kinds of programs. At one point, they recognized the need to develop a certification program for their product. Obviously, they sell a live product that is shipped across interstate lines. They developed a certification program that was certified by the state of Arkansas that involved testing of their fish to make sure and, and, and verify and to certify that the fish that they were selling were free of important diseases of concern and free of aquatic nuisance species of concern as well. Through this, this certification program and the testing program that went along with it, they recognized that they could turn this into a marketing advantage. They developed a logo, they developed uh, this motto, Safe Bait from the Natural State. They've taken this and developed marketing programs that are really quite exciting. The Scott Martin Challenge is, is, is one of those. The important lesson in this is that marketing was something that their membership wanted to do more of. They used the association as a vehicle both to develop the certification program and then also to develop marketing programs as an association and as an industry. These programs have really been quite effective. If I move to the second success story I want to, to mention is with the Catfish Farmers of Arkansas. Now, I'm using examples that I'm familiar with, but across the United States, there are many other examples of very successful associations that have been able to successfully add value to their membership by addressing some of the key issues and concerns that their members had. In Arkansas, the Catfish Farmers of, of Arkansas, at one point, worked with the electric companies in order to change the status of the members of their association and changed it to a preferred customer status so that catfish farmers in Arkansas would re receive 
much quicker service, especially in the event of power outages. Obviously, with the requirement for aeration on catfish farms, a power outage can have serious consequences, and, and they, they were able to do this. In addition to, to, to that change, they were also able to, to change some billing systems in a way that reduced the cost of electricity, and, and again, provided a real value to their membership by working on that issue. They do things like, like holding an annual catfish fry for their, their state legislators and their aides. This is an opportunity for them to talk with their elected officials and make sure that the officials understand their businesses. The officials who do represent them need to understand what will and will not affect their business and what might help their businesses and what kinds of things might have adverse effects on their businesses. So it's an op important opportunity to be able to do that. The catfish farmers of Arkansas were also successful in passing a, a restaurant labeling law that required restaurant managers in the state of Arkansas to inform their patrons as to whether the catfish that they were serving was raised in the United States or whether it was imported. They also were able to work as an association to convince the state to enforce that labeling law with routine inspections. So again, these are activities that, that added value to their members by, by addressing some of their key concerns. They also created an Arkansas Catfish Promotion Board that is a checkoff program that funds promotion and, and research activities that are important to their industry. The board is composed of catfish farmers who, who make the decisions about, about what the, the, the most important needs are. Some recent examples of their activities include featuring the Arkansas Secretary of Agriculture and a radio spot for advertising. They've developed billboards with ad advertisements for U.S. farm-raised catfish to promote their product. They've delivered plaques individually to restaurants that are serving U.S. farm-raised catfish as well to recognize the support of, of their industry. They also recognize research and extension personnel for doing the kind of work that is helpful to them. Again, this sends a strong message to, to researchers in terms of what kinds of research is most needed by their industry and most helpful to them. They also recognize industry people who go out of their way to contribute to the association, to the industry, people who spend time working on industry initiatives and association initiatives that are beneficial to everyone in the industry. So these are some examples that, that I'm familiar with. There are many other state associations around the United States that have different specific activities that they've worked on. The key is that they're providing value to their members, are engaged with their membership so they know what the biggest concerns are, and come up with initiatives and activities that, that will benefit their industry and work on some of the pressing problems that they have. Now let's talk just a little bit briefly about some of the research literature about the value of associations. There's not a lot of literature on it, but there is some, and it's always important to, to sort of look at this. This particular study showed that trade associations and industry associations do contribute to industry growth. They do this primarily by providing opportunities for networking. These networking opportunities offer opportunities for, for members to come together and talk with each other, often at conferences, at workshops, or other meetings that are sponsored by the association. Another study looked at, at how sort of these centers of expertise emerge in different parts, primarily driven by association activities that encourage participation in the industry. We can think of concentrations of the industry for example, trout in Idaho and trout in North Carolina and catfish in Mississippi, Arkansas, and Alabama and different parts of the United States. A catfish farmer who is, is operating in a state outside of the main industry group does not have access to the same kinds of infrastructure that, that industries do where they're clustered in certain states. Associations help to encourage that kind of clustering and, and, and support for industries within certain areas. Viability of industries has been shown also 
to be enhanced when associations do interact with their representatives and do this in a way to make sure that they understand the industry and understand the, the needs and concerns of, of the industry. There have not been a lot of studies looking at the value of aquaculture associations, but there is a fairly recent one that looked at shellfish grower associations in the northeast part of the United States. This study found that the shellfish grower associations in the U.S. created value and promoted cooperation among growers, again, mostly through workshops and conferences that, that were sponsored. They also identified and communicated research needs to the research community. They also worked with their representatives about the needs of the industry and the general public. Sometimes producers don't always think about public relations campaigns, but if we think about the issues of regulations, regulations are put in place to comply with laws that are passed by our elected officials based on the interests of their constituents who are part of the general public. So associations that also educate the general public can help to dispel some of the common myths that we all know exist related to aquaculture. This study also showed that some of the, the activities that were recognized as providing value to the members of the association included activities on the part of shellfish grower associations to disseminate news about the industry, news about upcoming policies, things that are, are very important to individual members, things like news related to shellfish poisonings in specific locations, prevention of spread of some species that predate on shellfish, the latest research results, and, and things like that. So this study as well asked shellfish to respond to a series of questions and, and sort of rate the relative and importance of a variety of different kinds of association activities. 90% of the respondents to their survey said that receiving this kind of information on shellfish diseases and, and species that could predate on shellfish is very important to their, their businesses. 75% thought it was very important to receive information on products and suppliers. So these are things that are valuable to the members and, and these were activities that associations were conducting that, that were providing value to their members. 80% of the respondents also said that advocacy activities by the association was also quite important. So this is some information that shows the kind of things that, that have been valued by, by members in terms of, of, of the value of their membership in the association. So if we sort of summarize these things and look at some of, of what the most important benefits have been to producers, are things like conferencing and, and networking, industry alerts are quite important, representation with regulators and elected officials, commenting on rulemaking activities, on, sur on surveys that have been conducted of industry associations. These are the kinds of things that, that tend to emerge as, as providing the greatest benefit to producers. Now up until now, I've been talking mostly about producers and benefits to producers, but what about the research and extension community? I do want to make it clear that I think it's, it's very, very important for extension and research personnel to be engaged with industry associations. Most industry associations have a, an educational category for membership and encourage and, and welcome that kind of participation. I would argue very much that for extension research personnel, engaging with industry associations is very much worth their time. It helps them to identify research priorities, target research that's important to industry, that kind of research gains greater exposure than others. For industry associations, the, the work by extension personnel to help facilitate activities and participation by research personnel clearly benefits these associations. At the same time, some surveys have been done that show, and, and it, it's to be expected that the perspectives of extension and research personnel are different from those of producers. 
research scientists tend to be evaluated by numbers of publications and things like that. That tends to be one of their primary, primary, primary issues and concerns. Whereas with a farmer, the main question in their mind every year is whether they're going to make any money or are they going to lose money? Are they going to make enough money to pay tuition for their children? Are they going to make enough to pay their medical bills? Or are they going to have to struggle through a year of, of losses? So the, the perspectives are different, but certainly there are many examples of associations where, where both groups come together. Both groups tend to rate the value of conferences and meetings very, very high. But after that, there's some differences where producers rate industry alerts and representation with regulators as, as, as much greater value than, than research and extension personnel who tend to prefer more, more research-oriented kinds of, kinds of information. So what are the kinds of lessons that, that we can glean from the research, from experience with different associations, and from various surveys that have been done some of the most effective state associations in terms of what makes them effective. If we're talking about industry trade associations, the fact that they're producer driven is quite important because the value to the membership, if the membership is going to include many producers, they need to perceive and receive value from their membership in order to continue to renew and, 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 and continue to participate in, in that particular association. University people really are not allowed to advocate for an industry, whereas producers can and should advocate for their industry, for example. Extension personnel can facilitate, but they're not able to, to advocate. So being producer driven for an industry association is quite important to keep it focused on priorities of its producer membership to maintain that, that base. Leadership is all important, and we'll come back to that in a little bit. Effective leadership can, can really help develop an association into a strong association. In any group of individuals, conflicts are, are going to occur, and so the leadership must spend time and, and and take the position to be able to create transparency and trust, engage with the membership, make everyone feel welcome, and to be transparent in terms of how, how decisions are made within that particular association. The leadership also needs to, to keep the membership focused on the general good of the industry, not the specific agen agendas of individuals. By doing so, by keeping a focus on activities that provide value in general to all their members, they can keep the association working together and very much engaged. One of the reasons why associations fall apart is that the inevitable conflicts that happen between different businesses, if these are allowed to dominate, <clears throat> dominate an association, then it can result in factions and other things that can lead to, to the downfall of associations. An effective association is one that's very much in, engaged with its membership, engaged in, in the sense that there's, there's feedback, that the leadership understands the key issues and, and, and directs and creates initiatives that, that, that address the key issues and concerns of the membership, but also one that that, that really encourages members to engage and participate in all activities. And then of course, the all important value for membership that I've been talking about throughout. Memberships have to perceive that there's a value and so by engaging with membership and by attacking key issues that, that can be worked on by the associate, so association or ways to create value for that, that membership. Other aspects and, and other kinds of activities that are critical is some sort of training for leadership succession. This can be informal and it can be as simple as the, the Young Farmers Program of Catfish Farmers of, of America, but to engage with, with young farmers and help them 
help them develop leadership skills along, along the way, really sort of on the job by assigning them to different committees and different projects. Members need to spend time and in any effective association, there are members that spend time on the various activities to make them successful and to be able to, to carry them out to produce that all important value for, for their members. Members need to travel to speak for the association goals and initiatives and commit that time to doing it. Now, sometimes people say that well, we're just not big enough to be able to do this and, and we're not big enough to have an effective association. Well, often a small group of people can make this happen. In reality, sometimes a single individual can make it happen and that individual does not have to be the president. I had an opportunity to, to attend an association meeting not just too long ago, very effective association. It's very clear that this was is a successful association, has a lot of good activities going on. The members are engaged and active, they get along, they meet in groups and talk about things that they need to be doing as an association. And as I attended that meeting and went around and talked with people, I asked, what's the key to this association? What's the key that really makes this effective when, when others are have, have not been as effective? And everybody eventually turned and pointed to a single individual. And they said, that's the person who comes and gets us excited about, about these different activities. When we all agree to do something, that's the person that calls and reminds us that we need to show up and we need to be there. So sometimes a single individual other than the elected officers can be very, very important and, and, and effective in, in associations. So some of these keys are effective and transparent governance, governance and leadership, development of trust, making people feel welcome. I'm in the middle of a, a survey right now of, of associations in the north central region of the United States and, and, and there are comments there uh, about about different factions and, and what's happened in some associations that are not as strong as they once were. Providing for leadership succession is also important. Some associations that have very strong leadership, if no mechanism is put in place to begin to develop leadership among some of the younger members and other members and pull them onto the board and put them in positions to serve on committees and, and begin to be active and and learn how the association operates. Without that, the association may not be able to continue as strongly when, when the, the leadership retires. Governmental affairs and being engaged in governmental affairs is important to producers that belong to associations as are public affairs. Communication strategies need to be, need to be considered. It's important for there to be adequate communications internally to maintain trust with membership and also externally to, to be able to promote the, the interests of the industry in terms of public affairs and, and perceptions as well. So good communication skills and strategies are important, adding value for members that I cannot repeat often enough because that's the key to membership retention is to add that value, leadership succession, and training the younger farmers for future leadership roles. I'm repeating some of these points because they're just so important. Well, let's talk a little bit about activities in the North Central Region. The North Central Regional Aquaculture Center identified strengthening state aquaculture associations as a priority in its strategic planning efforts and, and has developed two projects right now that are underway. Since these are just underway, uh, really just talk about what's going on. Uh, by the end of next year, 2018, we'll have more results and materials that we'll make available widely across the United States that hopefully will, will benefit people. This graph that is on your screen right now is from the Office of the Director of the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center based on an assessment that was done several years ago about state aquaculture associations in the North Central region. As you can see, there are several states that have very effective and strong and active aquaculture associations on the state level, 
but there's some other states that previously had strong associations, but today those associations are no longer quite so strong. So this is really the rationale for, for the attention that the North Central Region is paying to trying to strengthen the associations in, in their region, recognizing the value that strong state associations can have on industry growth. So there are two projects underway. The first one is to really assess the status of state aquaculture associations in the region through a survey. The survey is working to, to gather information in, from people who are currently members of a state aquaculture association, from those who have never joined an association, and from those who once were members but did not renew their membership and identify the reasons for their current status. Why did they not renew their membership? Why have they never joined? Um, why have they never joined an association? This survey is still underway, but for example, in looking at some of the preliminary results of the data, nearly 30% of those who have never joined an association said that they've never been asked to join. And so right there is a clue to people who are trying to build their associations is to spend the time and effort to find those individuals in, in their state or raising the species that, that their association is, is concentrating on and, and sending them an invitation to it. Not renewing the membership, there are lots of reasons, but some do not see the value of it. In some other cases, there were issues with factions developing and things like that. So we'll have more results when we complete that survey and, and complete a full analysis of it. The survey is also collecting information to identify barriers and challenges to membership and associations, as well as identifying those kinds of services likeliest to attract membership to join and then to, to renew their, their memberships as, as well. One of the focuses on these projects is to also develop leadership skills in the region. So part of these projects is to develop strategies to enhance participation in the associations by increasing value and member satisfaction, looking at the kinds of mission and goals that would be most appropriate and maybe different across different states as well, looking at various structures of the association the two state association examples I gave of the Arkansas Bait Association and the Catfish Farmers of Arkansas have very different structures, but they're both effective associations. So identifying the kinds of structures that, that may be best for different state associations in the North Central region is part of, part of the goal and best ways to engage membership with activities and the best strategies for communications. These days we have more ways to communicate than ever before. Some people prefer some ways over others. So we're looking to develop those strategies to be able to make those recommendations in the North Central region. And then as part of this, we're developing a leadership training program that will follow up based on the information we, we, we get from the survey that, that we're finishing up. We'll invite participants from across the region. We're hoping to to have participants that are both very experienced producers and some newer, younger producers as well. The participants will be asked to work within their states to identify state priorities. Each one will choose an initiative related to their state priorities that they will work on throughout the length of the training program. Throughout the training period, there will be mentoring both of their peers of the other participants in the program and also the program facilitators who who are primarily extension personnel working in the North Central, North Central region. As part of this training and to provide background and support for the participants as they work on their initiatives, they'll receive, you know, they'll work with the, the program facilitators. But we will also hold two separate workshops. One will be on effective engagement with association members and the other on effective media relationships as well. These obviously address some of the things we've already talked about that we know are important to, to strong industry associations. We will, by the end of 2018, have a lot of information that we will be disseminating widely, beginning with the North Central Region, 
in terms of details related to the design of the workshop, so these could be repeated in other states and other locations. We will make all the background materials available. There will be a whole series of educational deliverables that will be made available first in the North Central region and, and then more broadly in terms of the training packets, in terms of a uh, recorded webinar that summarizes the results of these projects. There will be fact sheets that we'll be putting together as well. So by the end of 2018, you can be looking for more specifics on, on these materials and, and the effects of, 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 of these projects sponsored by the North Central Regional Aquaculture Center geared towards strengthening state aquaculture associations in, in their region. Now at the end of the day, if we get back to the main topic of how to strengthen state aquaculture associations, I really cannot emphasize enough that it really comes down to individuals. Individuals need to, to step up and contribute some of their time and engage with other members and work with other members to, to work on the initiatives that are important that create value for belonging to their associations. And so I'd like to leave you at the end of this webinar with a question for you. What will you do to help strengthen aquaculture associations?